I want to do what you do. That's a statement that I hear so often from so many students, uh, people that want to be a sports psychologist, and that may be something that you're thinking as well. And so because I get that question, uh, how do I do what you do so often, I thought I'd just create this video for you. So if you're watching this video, it's probably because you're really interested in going into the field of sports psychology, and I'm hoping that there's something I'm going to share in this video that's going to give some insight on uh, whether or not uh, this is the right path for you, or, or rather how to best navigate this path. Some of the common questions I uh, get are, should I get a master's degree? Should I get a doctorate degree? Um, do I need licensure or do I not need licensure? Uh, what type of program should I be looking for for grad school? Uh, how do I get an internship? Uh, how long does this really take? Uh, what's the difference between a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a counselor? Uh, what's the future of sports psychology look like? These are phenomenal questions and quite frankly the, the, the answer to many of those is not always clear in our field. So I'm going to do my best to try to uh, shed some light uh, that would hopefully help you along the journey with, with those questions and more. Uh, let's begin by unpacking uh, the, the ultimate question, which is, which of the two paths do you really want to go down? And what I mean by that with the two paths is simply this. In our field of sports psychology, there is a path that leads towards licensure, it's more clinical, or there's a path that over here that leads a little bit more towards consulting, towards teaching, towards education. And they're two very distinct paths. And you have to decide in the end, like, what do you actually want to do with the knowledge that you're receiving? Because the path you go on is going to help um, steer you in one direction or the other. Uh, let's talk about the path that, that I personally traveled, which is the path towards licensure. Okay. To say you're a psychologist in many, if not all the states, actually means that you are a doctoral level licensed psychologist in that particular state. And to do that, that's a long road. For me, it was two years of master's, three years of a doctorate, one year of a, of a pre-doctoral internship, another year or two of post-doctoral internship, sitting for a national exam, state exams, and after all of that, you can uh, be on a, on a state's national uh, state's registry as a licensed psychologist. And that term psychologist is actually a legally protected term. So if one is referring to oneself or somebody else is referring to oneself as a psychologist, but they don't have that actual license, it's actually illegal and it's a false representation. And so it's very important to know the distinction between that path. The path towards clinical leads towards that path of licensure. The other path over here, one can get a PhD in sports psychology. Uh, those uh, classes are oft, often offered in a department of kinesiology or education. Um, they do uh, teach some of the mental health and then some of the clinical counseling piece, but it's not as heavy of an emphasis. Uh, those doctoral programs may last uh, three years, four years, um, and when you're done, though, you're not able to sit for an actual license um, to become a licensed psychologist or a licensed professional counselor uh, in that process. You would have a PhD in, in sports psychology, perhaps, and you could do excellent outstanding work as a consultant. And it's more focused on sport performance in particular. Um, a lot of individuals that go that path end up teaching in academia and they teach uh, the sports psychology classes at universities and do a wonderful job with that. They often do consulting with um, teams, uh, individuals. Uh, it's more of a fee-for-service as opposed to if you went the clinical path, there's some insurance reimbursement that can come uh, with that uh, as well. And so the fee-for-service path is a little bit more on the, um, on the, on the uh, PhD con consulting side. Uh, if you do get a PhD in, in sports psychology, uh, one of the misnomers is that you're a sports psychologist. Uh, you're actually a sports psychologist, a sports psych. <laughs> it's important for me to be clear on that. You're a sports psychology consultant, um, and that's a very different um, uh, title than the uh, licensed psychologist. And the public oftentimes doesn't know the difference. They think that anybody that's done mental skills training of some kind, uh, they may say that that person is a sports psychologist. That's, that's not necessarily true. And just to be clear, psychiatrist, that's a person who has a medical degree, 
and they are really focused on what type of medication you might need, a psychologist, doctoral level licensed, a licensed professional counselor, an LPC, that's somebody that has a, a master's degree, typically about two years of schooling and then another two more years of uh, training, and then they sit for an actual exam uh, to get licensed. Um, in their particular state, so it's a, a counselor. Uh, the term therapist is a little bit more uh, generic and that one, uh, most people could call themselves a therapist of, of any kind and it doesn't really have a particular uh, legal ramification with it. Uh, consultant, um, you know, sports psychology consultant is a, is a common title for those who uh, choose a path of uh, PhD in sports psychology or a master's in sports psychology uh, that don't need to licensure. Um, so that's uh, important that you just understand the, the terminology uh, of those two. Um, regarding my particular journey uh, and how I got into this field, and, and maybe that can help you with the, some of the early uh, steps in, in your process, I went to Lafayette College, and when I was there, I actually made up my major called psychobiology. It was uh, I was interested in half psychology and half biology as it related to the bo body and mind, and uh, a wonderful professor, Dr. Uh, Wendy Hill, was a, uh, an advisor. So let's, let's just create that into a psychobio major. It's now more commonly referred to as a neuroscience or behavioral neuroscience. Um, but after college, I got into a master's program in clinical psychology. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get directly into some doctoral programs. And it's really hard to get into a doctoral program uh, straight from college. Um, they really want to see you have some clinical experience, work experience, or some mas a master's degree, uh, which is what I did. I, I got a master's in clinical psychology, um, and during my master's degree, as well as my bachelor's, I uh, researched hypnosis for my thesis and studied a uh, relationship with hypnosis and pain, uh, again, trying to do a, a bit of a mind-body, health psych um, a perspective. I did get into a doctoral program in clinical health psychology uh, in Chicago and went out there for that doctorate uh, degree. It was three years. Uh, during that time, I was on the health psych track, which was really great. A lot of great behavioral medicine, neuropsych uh, kind of coursework. Um, I did in two practicums while out there. One was at uh, the Diamond Headache Clinic. That was uh, really great, uh, getting, again, more mind-body connection. And then one was at uh, Northwestern Neuropsych Associates. Uh, that was uh, mostly in an inpatient substance abuse uh, department within a hospital where I did a lot of the neuropsych work with that. So again, not exactly sport focused, but very much understanding the brain, understanding the nervous system, understanding the hospital, the, the, the entire uh, medical community and how that all interacts um, to health and well-being. Um, I then did a, a, an internship, you have to do a pre-doctoral internship, and that's a match program where you really can go anywhere in the country. Um, I left Chicago and went down to Jersey Shore Medical Center uh, in New Jersey and rotated through the entire uh, hospital system, inpatient psychiatric, outpatient drug and alcohol, outpatient mental health, uh, a pain clinic. Um, but they particularly had a sports medicine rotation where I would work alongside uh, fellows in sports medicine and so really got a chance to um, see a little bit more of the psychology associated with injury as it relates to uh, sports medicine. Um, I did my doctoral uh, thesis on, on sports and, uh, and football and, and pain and, and coping. And again, that was able enabling me to research and pull together a lot of my interests. So I would encourage you along your way, even though you might not get the classes in sports psychology because there's just not the plethora of them out there in these programs, uh, that, that are leading to, to uh, clinical and licensure. It's very important to try to make all your papers as best you can about some aspect of sports psychology, enabling you to research and apply your knowledge and learning to the field of, uh, of sport and performance. Uh, that's what I did, and, and I would encourage you, especially with a dissertation, to, to, uh, to do the same. Um, that being said, after the uh, um, doctor, uh, pre-doctoral intern and after the thesis and such, then I was a, a doctor, uh, had a doctor of clinical psychology, but I didn't have a license at, at that point in time. So there's really not a whole lot I could do with that. I had to do postdoc fellowship, um, which generally could take between one and three years of logging hours uh, that are um, uh, clinical. 
And so I did my uh, postdoc internship out of a private practice and I initially came out more in the medical model of uh, working in, in a hospital alongside a private practice. Um, but along that journey, something shifted. I was working with individuals doing um, uh, health psych work in hospitals and it was rewarding to help them get out of the hospital. Uh, but I would share very similar cognitive behavioral techniques with some athletes in my private practice there. And it was more gratifying to have them go out and compete, let's say, in a wrestling match that weekend and, and have success and come back the next week and say, hey, doc, that was really helpful. You know, what do you have for me next? And I was instantly really hooked on the idea of utilizing uh, the, the knowledge and education I had to not just uh, help people with health and wellness, but with performance. It, quite frankly, it was fun and enjoyable, and uh, it lent itself a lot to positive psychology. And so I quickly then started shifting my focus um, to sports psychology. Many people say, well, how did you actually grow a practice in sports psychology? What I simply did was I went out into the community and I had a handout with some information on goals or vision. Um, and I went to any coach that would allow me to give a free pro bono talk to their team. And so I did that. And in talking to the teams about uh, sports psychology um, and mental health, uh, I give them the sheet and they take that home to their family and, and show, show that. And then, you know, usually from each talk, I'd, I'd pick up maybe one referral. One person would come to the private practice and I'd, I'd be able to help them. And, and consequently, um, they'd have a little success and maybe tell somebody else. And, and little by little, uh, that's how it grew. And eventually went from uh, some high schools to some local colleges, and and uh, it really developed from there. So that's the uh, the path and the journey that I went on from I'm interested in this topic to now um, uh, you know I passed my my exams, got that, uh, that got that licensure, and went on my own, created a company called Mind of the Athlete, where our message is clear mind, uh, better performance, and. Uh, and able to practice full-time as a sports psychologist. Um, what would I suggest to you? I'm biased uh, to the path towards licensure and towards the clinical path. And the reason I'm biased is because I feel like it's very difficult today to separate mental health and sports psychology. There, there's such an entanglement uh, with that. So I do think the training that leads not just to the sports psychology piece, but to the mental health piece that would come with a clinical track is very, very important. Um, I also think what's also important is having a, a program that has a significant emphasis, emphasis on the neuroscience. Uh, when we talk with athletes today, they're always looking for high performance and they want to know the why. So you need to explain to them the neuroscience of anxiety. What is literally happening in the body when you feel nervous before you compete? And if you can understand and explain neuroscience to them, that goes a long way. It's also very important to understand health psychology, their entire holistic approach to health and well-being. Uh, for example, medication. Many athletes are on medication. So if they are taking a little medic medicine and maybe they experience some dehydration, you know, how might that impact the medicine? How might that impact sleep? How might that impact mood? And so being well-versed in health psychology, I think is going to be very valuable. So if you are looking for coursework and taking classes, uh, I definitely think that the, um, that the health psych, neuropsych um, education, along with the sport piece, if you can find it, would be great. It's, quite frankly, it's just hard to find many doctoral programs in uh, clinical sports psychology. Uh, we're still in our infancy, I'd say, in terms of a field, and so there's, there's just not as many options. So if you can't find that type of program, then finding something with a health psych focus will be your, your next best bet. You might be wondering, hey, do I get a master's degree or do I get a PhD, a PsyD? What, what, what should I do, master's or doctorate? That's a, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I do think that the, the doctorate is the, the way to go, uh, if you can, uh, simply because uh, the, the, the mind is so complex. Uh, there's, there's so much to learn, so much to know. And the longer you're in school, the more you're studying, the more you're doing rotations, the, 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 the more empowered and equipped you really do become to uh, provide great information, uh, knowledge, expertise to the people that you serve. Um, but the, the doctorate may not be as realistic for, for you. 
Um, it may not be financially a uh, viability. Uh, it is a long road. It is expensive, and, and, you're, and you're not working uh, while you're in school, typically to, to earn back some of that money in a way that could make it work in the long run. So if you're thinking, thinking about a master's degree, um, go for that. And I, that's what I did. I went for the master's. And at the end of the master's, I actually said, you know, I, I got more in the tank. I feel like I could study for a couple more years. So and let me keep going. And a lot of those credits did transfer over. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like I lost um, uh, credits uh, by doing master's and doctorate. But if you think about a master's, what you need to know is this. It's two years of a master's. And then it's two years of um, in internship clinicals as you study for your uh, LPC, your Licensed Professional Counselor exam, and that LPC is very, very important uh, so that you can call yourself a Licensed Professional Counselor. You can submit to insurance companies, which is very helpful uh, for reimbursement, and, and certainly in a private practice, it opens up more doors. If you can take an insurance card and get on some of those insurance panels with, um, with some of those major companies, uh, that's, that's really beneficial. So. I think that the uh, master's degree is really valuable if, if you have about four years um, and, you, and then you need to and want to really kind of get to work. Um, what I would say for people getting a master's degree is, is this. If you're, if you're going to get a master's degree, uh, try to um, you know, study and learn as much as far as you can, but then as you practice, get very specific. Uh, in this world today, it's really hard to be an expert at, at everything. And, and people are, are going to come to you typically because you're the best at X, whatever X may be. And so uh, kind of a weird and corny analogy I sometimes use is if I had a cancer of the pinky, right, of the left pinky, and uh, I don't even think there is cancer of the left, left pinky specifically, uh, but if there was, and, and, and I was the best doctor in the world, or, or rather I was looking for the best doctor in the world for uh, left pinky cancer, I, I'd, I'd research, I'd find that person, and I would go to that person. Uh, that's how specific the world's really become when they're looking for somebody um, to, to help. And particularly since a lot of healthcare has begun to shift towards uh, uh, being able to be done via um, electronically, remotely, uh, you can get consultation or provide consultation with people. Um, there are regulations uh, around that as well uh, that we have to buy to, but that can be very helpful in, in making you um, very successful at whatever that X is, that, that, that one thing that you, that you do. So for example, uh, I've seen uh, some individuals get a master's degree in LPC and then say, okay, I am going to focus on uh, females. So, or they may say, I'm going to focus on high school females, or more sp specifically, they're saying, I'm going to focus on high school uh, women's soccer players. That's that's their niche. And quickly, uh, everybody in the community realizes that there is a person um, who is really catering to a particular slice of the demographic. And I would encourage you, uh, if you're going to go master's level, to really think about getting super specific, uh, maybe even um, regarding a particular condition that you um, feel very passionate about. Uh, I know of one individual who just focused on uh, titratillomania. And so if you're not familiar with what that is, that's a, a condition where an individual may begin to uh, pluck some of their, their eye, uh, eyebrows, uh, eyelashes, some of their hair. And so it has its roots in some anxiety, uh, but it's a specialized uh, uh, condition. And uh, because it is common, um, when an individual struggles with this, they may want to try to find somebody who's the expert. Well, this one person I'm referencing was, was the expert, and, and people come far and wide. And so they really knew one thing, and they knew it really, really well, and they built an entire practice around that. So in your situation, what would be that one thing that you are really passionate about? Uh, the topic or maybe the demographic um, that you would uh, really focus in on. In the book Good to Great, uh, Jim Collins talked about this hedgehog concept. And I think it's really relevant if you're going to consider this path of, of uh, sports psychology. In the hedgehog concept, what he's saying is it's a combination of three concentric circles that are all overlapping. And one circle is, you know, what are you really passionate about? What are you really passionate about? And then the, uh, the, the next circle is, uh, what could you be the best in the world at? 
that you would be the person they want to contact when, when this problem arises. And then lastly, you know, what could drive your economic engine? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you need to get compensated for your services and, and what would pay you the most for what you have to offer. And that intersection of those three is really what they call the hedgehog concept, meaning you know, hedgehog has one defense system as opposed to a fox, which has many. The hedgehog would, hedgehog would roll up in a ball and put up its spikes and, and that's the way it would protect itself. What would be that one thing that you're uh, really passionate about and, and would drive your economic engine? You could be the best in the world at because you know that particular area. So uh, that's what I would encourage you, uh, both for a master's and a doctor, but that's particularly helpful um, for your, your per journey and pursuit um, with, a, with a master's uh, degree. Um, the tough part about a doctorate is, uh, part of it is just, it's a long road and it's very expensive. And so certainly if you're uh, able to get a scholarship or get this paid for or some way, or if you're fortunate enough to have the economic means uh, to to do that and have um, um, school paid for, uh, it'll make it easier on the back end. Uh, but the reality is, I mean, this is, this is you know hundreds of thousands of dollars could be, and you'll be in debt potentially, and so you need to make that up. And so making up the debt from psychology uh, grad school is very personalized, very individualized. But for for some, it, it, it could be a significant uh, struggle and journey. Um, uh, taking out loans and having to uh, pay that back. So well, I guess what I'm trying to say is when you're finally done with all of that education, you need and want to start making um, a significant amount of money that would be able to provide for your way of life, your living, and then also if you are trying to erase some debt. And so that's a, a, a tricky place that some people can, can find themselves in um, afterwards. So it is a bit of a math equation, and you got to think about um, about that. Um, the truth is, when we work with insurance companies, the reimbursement for a doctorate and a master's level from insurance companies isn't all that significantly different uh, in some situations. And consequently, if you do the math and run that, you actually may be better off financially uh, getting a master's degree and being a, a master's level sports counselor, right? A licensed sports counselor. Um, and that may actually be a more financial uh, viability. Uh, but again, Individual preference, individual finances, individual uh, motivation, intrinsic motivation and drive for the for the degrees. But I uh, wanted to share that with you. Uh, many times, uh, you, people are thinking, you might be thinking as well, like, where do I go to get more information on, on this stuff? And that there are two great paths, two great links. Um, one is the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal association. Wonderful people um, doing uh, great work and uh, really advanced in the field. And so if you look up the Association for Applied Sports Psychology and their website, you are gonna find um, just a, a trove of great uh, uh, links and articles and uh, information that's gonna help clarify that path. And, and uh, for many and most on the path, it's, it, that tends to be a lot of uh, a focus on the consultant uh, path and the, and the PhD sports psychology or master's level sports psychology. Uh, that's not the path to clinical. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't many uh, psychologists and counselors in that association, because there are, uh, but that association tends to be a little bit heavier on this other path. Uh, uh, conversely, uh, the American Psychological Association uh, has a Society for Sport, uh, Exercise, and Performance Psychology. It's uh, Division 47 within the APA, the American Psychological Association. Um, and that society is, is, is outstanding as well. And, and they, during uh, the APA's national uh, convention each year, the society will have its own opportunity for its members to connect and uh, present and talk. And, and they do wonderful um, work as well. That, that tends, because the American Psychological Association tends to be a little bit more on the mental health, clinical uh, counseling side. Um, both are phenomenal organizations, uh, wonderful people. Highly encourage you to get connected with both and to uh, network and, and navigate uh, with those uh, individuals. Um, another question you're probably thinking is, hey, what about internships? Uh, I want to intern. I just want to kind of check this out. I, I know internships are, are great and, and they're, they're a popular thing to do and I think that they're fantastic. Uh, here's a challenge. 
it's really difficult to find an internship in sports psychology. Um, and one of the big reasons is because the nature of the one-on-one -on -one counseling, again, coming from a more clinical angle, those are legally protected conversations. And so uh, it, it would be um, challenging and maybe not even appropriate for an intern to be in uh, that space for somebody when they're uh, receiving that kind of counseling. So you might want to have exp exposure to what you might do as a sports psychologist, but one of the things you might do as a sports psychologist primarily is counsel, but you really can't see that. And so therefore it makes interning a little bit uh, trickier and, and difficult. Uh, sports psychologists often consult with teams, and so there may be an opportunity for you as an intern to go along with a sports psychologist to sit on a team. But again, those are closed societies. They don't, they don't often like an outsider to come in the locker room or the team room. Um, or these offices and, and, and hear uh, what's what's kind of going on. So uh, that would take a unique situation to allow you to be part of that. Um, and then the other piece that a lot of sports psychologists do is uh, keynote speaking. And that's the part that's more easily for you to get involved with. Um, you could research, you could uh, help write and create PowerPoints and information um, for those kind of speeches. And you could attend them. You could see behind the scenes of, what does a sports psychologist do and how they prepare and how they share that information. So that is a, a big uh, area that you could uh, be of help with in, in such a situation. Uh, got to hydrate here. So as an intern, um, oftentimes they're done in the summer times. You could do them in the fall or the winter or the spring for some course credit, uh, class credit. Um, what would I suggest? You know, reach out to people in the community and find out if there's a, somebody with a, uh, a sport focus, if they're willing to allow you to shadow. Um, it, it is really tough. I know that personally at Mind of the Athlete, we've run an internship program for over a decade. Uh, we've had applicants from all over the country and, and people literally moved to uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, where we're housed. Um, and the people come from Utah and from Carolina uh, for an internship, which really showed me an incredible motivation. Um, at the moment, our internship uh, program is suspended. Uh, and so the reason is just because na the nature of what I'm doing now is I'm on the road so much uh, speaking that I'm not in the office enough to properly mentor uh, the way that I would like to for an intern. So um, you can check back and see if uh, this summer will uh, have that internship or not, but um, as of right now, it's, 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 it's on hold. Uh, but interning is something that I would highly encourage if you can, if you can find it, if you can make that happen, uh, that, that would be, that would be great. One uh, other piece that I would suggest is a great piece of advice that I got along my journey. Somebody said, Jared, if you, if you want to be a counselor, uh, then you ought to be in counseling. And I think that's really great because too often we think about um, getting in the field of sports psychology and it's a lot of the outside in uh, head knowledge that comes from education, learning, interning, uh, practicums. Uh, and that's valuable. It's incredibly valuable. And then we also draw upon our own personal experiences that we, maybe we had in sports or injuries and health and, and such. And that's valuable as well. Um, but there's that third option that 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 experience of being on the other side of a counseling experience and really receiving and, and understanding what that is like and, and really being introspective on your own journey and your shortcomings, your blind spots, your strengths, your opportunities. And, and having that opportunity to really experience counseling is really, really valuable. And so if you're thinking about this path, um, that is a uh, part of the experience that I would really encourage you to do is reach out to somebody in, in your community and just say, hey, look, I'd like to engage in some counseling and, and learn as much as I possibly can. And maybe that's somebody at their college counseling center or, or a local psychologist. But uh, whatever it may be for you, I just encourage you to uh, consider that as well. Uh, lastly, on the path of becoming a, a, a sports psychologist, um, there's a lot of great books out there and really want to encourage you as best you can to uh, find some great books, find some authors, find some people out there that you might resonate with um, and read their stuff. Uh, 
Absolutely. One of the books that put me on this whole journey was uh, Dan Millman's book, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Uh, Dan is an author, a wonderful human being, and he wrote a, a fictional story loosely based upon some true facts. And it was wonderful. But once I read that book and I understood about the mind-body connection and about athletics, um, it really um, it made a difference in my, my college athletic uh, performance um, and, and helped me to really understand that the, there's so much capability to the mind and that I wanted to study it more. So uh, be sure to check out as many books as you possibly can. Lastly, uh, if I can plug you in uh, to some more resources, one of the things I'm really passionate about is saying, okay, um, what, could I, what could I do? Where could I go next? What, what could I possibly explore? Um, at Mind of the Athlete, we have lots of opportunities for you to learn as much as you can electronically. Um, for example, on YouTube, there are over 500 Mind of the Athlete YouTube videos on different nuggets of information that maybe I did on a TV show, or maybe we filmed in the office here with some interns, or maybe uh, part of a speech. But I would, I would encourage you to check out those videos on YouTube and to follow the Mind of the Athlete uh, channel. Uh, we've got a Mind of the Athlete program, a 10-hour audio video a curriculum with worksheets and CD audio uh, tracks and, and uh, videos that you could actually um, purchase online at the Mind of the Athlete store on our website. Um, tons more CDs that uh, we most recently created on sleep and confidence and, and even cell phones as well as visualization CDs. So there's a lot of resources uh, for you with that. Of course, we got all the social media out there, so maybe you'd be interested in uh, following us uh, as well. And lastly, you know, I'd be remiss to say, hey, if, if you want a book on uh, what I think is really, really important in terms of uh, mental health, sports psychology, it would be this one here. So this is a book that I wrote, Mind of the Athlete, Clear Mind, Better Performance. And it really shares um, how a person's pre-conscious mind uh, significantly impacts performance and how if that pre-conscious mind is clearer, um, we feel better, we think better, uh, our reaction time is faster, and we have improved uh, sleep and less anxiety. So how do we, how do we have a clearer pre-conscious mind? Uh, that's what this book actually unpacks. And so I might encourage you to check it out on our website mindoftheathlete.com or on amazon.com as well. Okay, it was my privilege and pleasure to be able to share this information with you. I am optimistic that something I shared might help you along your journey. We need more people in the field of mental health and sports psychology, so I close just by saying to you, um, consider this path, and we would welcome you into our community of helpers and I hope that you enjoy the journey as much as I, as much as I have, and I wish you the best. Thanks so much.